Hi everybody to this brief demo of the tutorial mutation calling viral genome reconstruction and lineage clade assignment from SARS-CoV-2 sequencing data. My name is Wolfgang Meyer. I'm working from, for the European Galaxy team and I'm going to walk you through the most difficult um, parts of this tutorial. So to take a brief look at the outline of what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to run um, a sequence of production ready workflows that can be used to perform a full um, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing data analysis complete from raw sequence reads up to um, quality control reports, consensus sequences of the viral um, genomes of your different samples. So the analysis works with um, complete batches of, of uh, samples, um, like they would come out of real world genome surveillance projects. We're going to look at reports and visualizations, both at the sample and at the batch level, and we're going to do lineage assignment using Nextclade and Pangolin. So the workflows that we will be running and that are really at the core of this analysis, are one of these four workflows for going from raw sequenced reads to uh, mutations called per sample. And because we're going to follow along with the suggested example data from this tutorial, the workflow we're going to be using is the one from tiled amplicon illumina pad and uh, for tiled amplicon illumina pad and sequencing data. It will result in a, as its main output, as in a collection of VCF data sets um, that holds those mutations per sample in the batch. And then next, we're going to run a variation analysis reporting workflow um, that produces these reports and visualizations for us. And we're going to have a brief look at what's inside these reports and plots. Then we're going to run a third and last workflow, which is the COVID-19 consensus construction workflow. And it will incorporate, it will take those mutations per sample produced by the first workflow and it will incorporate them into the viral uh, reference sequence so that we obtain um, consensus genomes of all of our samples. And then with these consensus sequences, we're going to do the lineage assignment with Nextclade and Pangolin, which is uh, running a few tools manually inside Galaxy. Okay, then um, let's start um, because this is going to be brief and just explaining the more complicated steps in the tutorial. I already set up my analysis history, so I created a new analysis history, I named it, and I followed the instructions in the tutorial to upload all the necessary input data sets. So, just to confirm that everything went all right here. So what I have is I'm going with the described example data, as I said, in of this tutorial. So we're going to analyze a batch of very early, in fact, the first batch of Omicron data that came out of South Africa at the end of um, 2021. Um, and those are, we picked the subset of that of that batch and um, that's um, 16 different samples. So I have here a collection, a list of 16 um, pairs of fast QSinger um, GZIPed data sets. So raw sequencing data that was paired and sequenced on the Illumina platform. So if I step inside this, I see those 16 samples with their um, NCBI short reads archive identifiers as the um, element names here. And each of these elements actually is a pair with data sets, as it says here. So if I click on one of them, I should see that indeed there's a forward and a reverse data set contained inside of those. And each of these data sets is of the format FastQ Sanger G set, so G zipped FastQ Sanger, which Galaxy still allows you to preview here as plain text. So going back out of this list of pairs. So we confirmed this input is what it should be. Then I've downloaded the SARS-CoV-2 reference um, sequence just as described in the tutorial. And I ran the replace text tool on that as described in the tutorial to change the name of the sequence identifier to NC underscore 04551 
2.2.2 um, according to the instructions in the tutorial i renamed this data set to sars cov2 reference because that would be the input to the workflows that we're going to run next so this is okay too also note that the format here is faster um, then I've uploaded the SARS-CoV-2 feature mapping according to the instructions. That's a tabular file with the different um, RefSec identifiers of all the open reading frames, peptides um, in the SARS-CoV-2 genome in the first column, and then the more readable common names of those features in the second. Um, we can also go to a full view of that data set in the middle panel here um, and you see that this looks pretty much as the um, tutorial shows it um, important format is tabular so that's correct um, i've also uploaded the uh, primer information in bed format so that's important that this data set is a format bed if you look inside what this data set describes is um, different primers used in the Arctic V4 um, primer set for the tide amplicon amplification. It lists one primer per line. It lists where it binds with respect to the SARS-CoV-2 reference sequence. It lists the name of the primer to which amplicon pool that primer belongs in the fifth column. And in the sixth, you have the strand that on the reference genome that this primer is supposed to bind on. Um, don't worry about the names here of the sequences. So these are actually the INSTC identifiers. Uh, the, this is the INSTC identifier of the SARS-CoV-2 reference sequence. Um, the tutorial talks about the equivalence of this identifier and the NCBI RefSec identifier. For the primer bed file, it really doesn't matter which one is listed here, the two the, the tools that we're going to use with this primer bed file, they will not care about this name as long as there is just one single name in this file. Good. So data set, data type of this um, data set is bed format. So that's fine. And then we have a second file um, describing the primer scheme. And that's not to be confused with the first one. So this data set is the Amplicon info file and its data type should be set to tabular. And if we're looking inside this data set, we're seeing that it's a, a tabular data set with um, one line per Amplicon produced by the primer scheme. Um, and it lists the primers that are responsible for the formation of a given Amplicon per amplicon one on each line. So we have the, the primer number one left and the primer number one right on one column, on one line because together they form the first amplicon in that Arctic V4 primer scheme. And then we have one line per amplicon and it continues like this. So normally each line has two primers. For some primer schemes that use nested primers to produce a single amplicon with higher specificity or efficiency, there might be more than two primers on a single line. Good. So all the input data sets seem to be ready. So then we can actually grab the first workflow and we're going to grab this from a, um, uh, from a workflow registry. So I'm going to workflow in the top menu of Galaxy. I'm going to import one and I'm going to import one from a GA4GH compliance server. Um, and now I have the choice between Workflow Hub EU or DocStore. The workflows deposited in those two registries in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 um, um, uh, Galaxy workflows are identical, so the choice here is really yours. Um, I'm doing this from Europe, so I'm going to access the workflows via Workflow Hub EU. And then we're going to perform a search to find what's available in terms of SARS-CoV-2 analysis workflows for Galaxy on this registry. The tutorial says to type um, the search string here, so I'm going to look for organization. Um, 
term IWC. So now I'm filtering for all um, workflows contributed to Workflow Hub via the Intergalactic Workflow Commission, a, a group within the Galaxy project that takes care of, um, of producing high quality workflows for different kinds of analysis and for um, reviewing those and for submitting those to the Workflow Hub and to DocStore. Um, we are looking more specifically only for SARS-CoV-2 workflows produced by that organization. So I'm going to include the search term name and then SARS-CoV-2 in here. And then I'm filtering only for the workflows of interest for this tutorial. Um, so I said the example data is Illumina paired end sequenced using the Arctic Primer Scheme V4. Um, so this one here, SARS-CoV-2 paired and Illumina Arctic variant calling um, seems to be the one we want. I'm going to click it. And then I have the option to select any of the published releases for this workflow that's available on Workflow Hub. And usually if you don't have a good reason not to go for it, you would want the latest version of course. So V0.5 in that case and clicking on it imports this workflow right into Galaxy. And from there you have the option to run the workflow. And that's what we're going to do here. It brings up the workflow run interface. And now we have to make sure you, we populate the different inputs with the, with the corresponding correct input data sets. So it asks for a paired collection of sequenced reads. And yeah, I have this just one list of paired data, sequencing data sets that's called sequencing data. That's my data set 33 here. So that's already chosen as the right input here. Um, it asks for a faster sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 reference, and I prepared that too, so that's fine. Arctic primer bed um, needs to be that bed file with the primer information and the binding sites on the reference, so that's the correct file. And the Arctic primers to Amplicon assignments file needs to be the Amplicon info data set which is tabular and lists the primers on one line that together are responsible for the formation of one amplicon. So this is all auto-populated correctly um, by default luckily here. It doesn't have to be the case uh, every time in, in your situation if you set up your history slightly differently there might be mix-ups so please check these inputs carefully. Um, yeah, and then um, we can leave the rest of the parameters at their defaults and basically just run this workflow. You would have the option if you click this little gear wheel icon here to send these results to a new history. If you prefer to keep this prepared history here pristine and just create a new history where all the workflow results are sent to, you could check this little box. But for the purpose of this tutorial, it's actually preferable, I would say, to have everything go to one history. So I just press run workflow and off we go. And yeah, then the scheduling gets prepared. Um, Galaxy waits for this invocation of the workflow to complete and you will have progress bars visible here. And once everything is scheduled, we can look into the different results. Okay, so 
all 33 steps of this workflow have now been scheduled successfully. They are not finished, but the history will not um, acquire any new data sets from this workflow run anymore. So it's in good shape and we're just waiting for all these uh, remaining jobs to run and finish. Um, but at this point, we are um, good to set up the next workflow run and um, going back to the overview, that will be the COVID-19 variation analysis reporting workflow that we're going to run next. It will run on um, the, the um, collection of VCF data sets with mutations per each sample in our batch um, and create those plots and reports. And like the workflow before, we're going to obtain this um, from uh, Workflow Hub. Um, it's the exact same procedure, so we're repeating what I've shown you before. Go to Workflow to import, um, import from a GA4 GH server, choose Workflow Hub or Docstore, whatever you prefer. We're going to type our um, search query again, so that was organization um, colon IWC and then name filter SARS minus cough minus two. And we close the quotes here. Um, and then we're back here and the top hit is actually the COVID-19 variation reporting workflow we want. So we expand that, we see the different releases available for this workflow. We pick the latest and we're getting this imported in to our list of workflows. We're ready to run it and that's what we're going to do. We bring up the workflow run interface. And now this workflow asks for two input files. That's the variation data to report up here. And it's the gene products translation files down here. Um, so the variation data to report, you need to be careful to choose the right one. So the one that it suggests here is final SNP of annotated variants with strand biased soft filter applied. If you read the tutorial carefully, it will warn you though that for tiled amplicon data, this is an experimental file because that strand bias filter used by the variant caller is not totally adequate for um, tiled amplicon data. So in this case, when we're following along with tiled amplicon data, no matter what primer scheme, we're not going to use this file, but we're using the parent of this file, the simple final SNPF annotated variants file, and ignore the later one, which is just experimental and you can expect you can expect it to learn what the difficulties are there, but um, go with this simpler file here. Um, we can leave all these filters at their defaults, um, but here we have to take action. So this gene products translation files, that's the feature mapping file we uploaded um, initially. And Galaxy chooses here another tabular file, the Amplicon info. So we have to correct this. We want the SARS-CoV-2 feature mapping file. And so this file um, will be used by the workflow to produce more readable um, names um, for the different genomic features of SARS-CoV-2 in those reports. So it's this file down here, the two column mapping between hard to read NCBI, RefSec identifiers, and more commonly used names of features. Then we're setting number of clusters to three. This will affect um, the variant frequency plot, the major plot produced by this workflow. Um, and I will just tell you how many clusters to consider main clusters in the batch. So um, when it does hierarchical clustering of the of the samples in the batch based on their, very, of, on their mutation profiles, how many of those clusters to treat as main clusters and set apart visually a little bit. So uh, the choice here is somewhat arbitrary and we just go with three because for the suggested batch, we established this to be a good number. 
Okay, then we're ready to run this workflow and it will just add data sets on top of the ones produced by the first workflow. And then we're back at this progress um, monitoring page again, where we see that Gedix is now preparing the invocation of this new workflow and it will add data sets and summarize the states of the different jobs. Okay, now, so at this point, um, the first workflow, the variation analysis workflow has um, finished. All its outputs are ready and we can explore a few of those key outputs now, even while the scheduling of the reporting workflow is still ongoing. So if you remember, we started out um, with the raw reads here and the steps that this workflow now performs is it first does quality assessment of these um, Illumina sequenced pad and reads um, with the tool called fast P and it um, produces quality metrics for the raw reads. Um, so letting us spot problems with the sequencing itself early on. Then it also performs trimming or even filtering of complete reads um, if their quality is really poor so that we only feed um, um, good quality trustworthy reads into the further analysis. We then map these reads with the tool called BWMM to the SARS-CoV-2 reference, um, filter those mapped reads again um, based on their mapping quality and whether the two reads from a pair could both be mapped to the reference or not. Um, we realign those reads with a tool called um, um, Lofrec Viterbi um, so that we um, especially produce high quality mappings around indel positions so this will improve the quality of indel calls later on um, we produce additional statistics on the mapped reads with sam tool stats we then add indel qualities um, with Lofrec again, uh, which is a prerequisite for indel calling with that variant caller. Um, then we do primer trimming, and this is where the Amplicon scheme and the primer scheme comes into play. So we use IVA trim to um, remove primer sequences um, from um, the mapped sequenced reads before doing variant calling with Lofrec. And then we use a tool called QualiMap to report all kinds of quality metrics and produce nice plots on um, the fully mapped and processed on the final mapping results, so to say. Um, the called variants are still annotated, filtered and annotated with a tool called SNPF. And this will um, add information to the variant calls about which genomic features of SARS-CoV-2 are affected by our variants, whether a given variant is, for example, a silent variant, so only taking effect at the nucleotide level, but not at the amino acid level, or if it affects an amino acid, what that change on the protein level would look like. Um, yeah, it does this questionable strand bias soft filtering where we said this is experimental and we ignored that file. And finally, from all the different mapping and read quality metrics we produced along the way, we produce the final pre-processing and mapping report. And this we can look at right now. So we just click the display icon here and we're dropped into this multi-QC um, report on all the different quality statistics that we obtained throughout this workflow. And 
this is really advisable that for each batch of data, you at least take a brief look at this report to see if there was any trouble with any of the samples in the batch. Here we're seeing um, um, coverage um, of the mapped reads on the SARS-CoV-2 reference. And we're seeing that out of our 16 samples here, most are shown in green and look quite okay. So for example, if we look at what percentage of positions in the SARS-CoV-2 reference are covered more than or at least 30 fold. So with more or equal 30 reads in each of um, our samples, we see that 99 and more or at least above 90% of all sites in the reference genome are covered more than 30 fold for most of the samples. We're doing a bit worse for the sample here for the 502 sample where that's just just below 80% of reads. But there is some trouble with at least three samples here according to this metric. So one that is really poor, which is this 54505 sample that only has 5% of the sites of the reference covered with more than 30 reads for the sample. And then we have uh, the second worst is this 4508 sample with 28%. And then we have 4506, which is also not particularly great. We also see a median coverage. And you see while for most samples, the median coverage over all sites in the reference is several hundred fold. Um, this is just 188 fold for this sample here. And it's really the median is zero for this sample. So this sample is probably too poor quality to do anything useful with it. Um, it's 52 fold for this one and also zero for that other, the 408 sample here. So, so there are some samples in this batch where we will really have trouble identifying mutations because if you don't have sequencing information, then how would you um, identify mutations? We can scroll further down and we see this illustrated in various other plots. So a particularly instructive one is this cumulative genome coverage plot, which shows the fraction of the reference that's covered by a certain coverage by a certain number of reads in each of the samples. And you see that some really good samples here have like 90% of their of their ref of the reference sequences covered by their by more than 1000 of their reads. So this is really excellent coverage. But then you see that the problematic samples like this uh, 505 sample has a very sharp drop in these coverage statistics. So even at a 50 fold coverage, only 5% of the reference positions are covered in the sample. And for the for eight sample, it's um, um, it's it's below 30% of reads covered at the 50 fold coverage. So yeah, there are problematic samples in there, and if you just go with these lines, you would say these four samples are the problematic ones, 502, 506, 508, and 505, in that order of severe, increasing severity. You can also see how the GC content distribution in the different mapped reads is um, a bit hard to interpret if you don't know what the default for SARS-CoV-2 in the genome would be. Um, you can see the mapping stats from SAMTOOL stats. You can see how many reads um, got aligned, mapped in the right orientation, and so on. Um, and you can see what the insert sizes for the reads in a pair would be. So how large the sequenced genomic fragments um, have been. And you see a nice distribution here, which is pretty much the same for all of the different samples. So there were no problems in the library preparation. Um, sequence quality of the reads and how much the effect of filtering would have been um, not a tremendous effect of fast P in that case, because quality was good originally already um, for read two, which is an, on average usually a bit worse in quality um, in Illumina sequencing than the forward reads. Um, 
filtering also still doesn't have a very big effect. Good, then, um, yeah, but most importantly, we are really interested in this coverage analysis and to identify the samples that will be problematic in the further um, analysis of the data. Okay, another interesting piece of information is actually whether the Amplicon scheme is really what we think it is. Um, so if in the sequencing lab, for example, they're changing the primer scheme they're using for generating the Amplicons and maybe they don't let you as the bioinformatician know that fact, it could be interesting to inspect the output of IVAR trim. So that's the fully processed reads for variant calling. That's the IVAR trim runs. Um, and if we expand those 16 data sets and look at their data set details, we can see the standard output produced by IVAR trim. And that informs us about what it found. And it says it could trim primers from our primer scheme from 33% of all reads. This is um, probably okay. So don't think that you should find primers on all of those reads because you're using the Samplicon scheme. Um, during sequencing, normally um, the, the Amplicons after generation get fragmented again and they're getting sequenced as these shorter fragments. So not every fragment sequenced has to start in a primer and end in a primer from the primer scheme. And that's why only about a third um, of, the, of the sequences needs primer trimming here. Um, that's also why the remaining 66 percent of reads started outside of primer regions, but that does not mean outside of Amplicon regions, but probably inside. And we want to keep those reads because they are just what you'd expect from the fragmented nature of those Amplicons during sequencing. What we want to um, drop though is um, the reads that really did not fall within an amplicon. So those would be in real contradiction to what we assume based on the amplicon info and the primer scheme. So if we find a read that extends or a pair of reads that extends outside of to outside of an amplicon, um, something would be fishy. And if we see this for many reads, then we should worry that maybe we are not assuming the correct primer scheme to begin with. Um, however, there's not much to worry here. There's just 0.56% of reads that did not, or, or pairs of reads that did not fall within an amplicon. Um, and so that's probably just what's to be expected as sequencing artifacts. Or maybe there was a bit of um, unamplified original genomic DNA um, in, in the sequencing um, um, pool. So 0.56% is really nothing to worry about. But if this number goes up to several percent or tens of percent, then chances are you're supposing the wrong primer scheme. And we could check this for all 16 samples. But if the sequences come from a single batch of prepared samples, then it's usually either or. I mean, either you are assuming the correct primer scheme or you don't. So checking one sample occasionally from a batch is totally enough. And then, yes, of course, the the key output of this workflow is then these SNPF annotated variants. Um, let me find those um, again. So here they are, the final SNPF annotated variants. Those are in VCF format. Um, and if you look inside of them, then this looks like this. So basically in the body of that file, you have one line per, um, per mutation that the variant caller found. And you have lots of quality statistics about the call that the variant caller made. Um, and you have those SNPF annotations somewhere annotated down here. 
in one long, long string. And you can easily imagine that this is not very nice to browse for a large collection of samples. So even with our 16, we would not enjoy going through this list and inspecting all this output um, and making trying to make sense out of it. So this is really the reason why we're running now the second workflow, the reporting workflow that is currently running um, to, to make this more digestible than the collection of the VCFs. That said, though, this collection of VCFs is important raw output, and it should be archived and kept because it has all the details that were ever known about your samples. So um, from that point on, we're really going to reduce information content. And so it's good practice to keep those VCFs around should you ever have questions about this batch of data again in the future. Um, so let's inspect what the reporting workflow has been doing so far. Yeah, it's making some progress and we're just waiting for it to finish scheduling now so that we can then start the third workflow, um, the consensus uh, construction workflow. So the final um, job produced by the um, reporting workflow and the job that will create the variant frequency plot um, has just been scheduled. And so now we are not risking anymore to mix up data sets produced by different workflows in our history. So we're ready to run the third and final workflow, the consensus construction workflow. By now you should be very familiar with this process, how to import it into Galaxy, go to the GA4GH servers, type your query again, that's organization um, IWC with the name SARS-CoV-2 again. Um, we're looking for the consensus workflow this time, and down here it is, consensus construction. We expand that. We see the different versions. We use the latest, import it into our list of workflows, and then we are ready to run this. Now, this workflow needs the variant calls again. So again, for tiled Amplicon data, this should not be the strand bias soft filtered uh, list of variants, but it should be the final SNPF annotated variants collection. So we'll inspect those VCFs again. We can leave the workflow parameters here at their defaults, but the consensus construction workflow needs two more data inputs to run. One is the aligned reads data for depth calculation. So this it needs because this workflow will try to mask out positions in the generated consensus genomes where a lack of coverage simply didn't allow calling of variants. So meaning because of a lack of coverage, certain positions in the con generated consensus genome might just be unknown or very uncertain. And to indicate this uncertainty, the workflow will incorporate ends into the consensus sequences at these sites, instead of just guessing and putting some either reference or alternate um, nucleotide in there. So it, what it needs is um, our fully processed BAMs that went into variant calling in the first workflow. And this is this data set fully processed reads for variant calling with the primers trimmed with realignment and in the qualities added. So this serves as an input. We can leave the step threshold for masking at its default. Um, and then we need the reference genome again, because this workflow will try to incorporate the called mutations found by the variation analysis workflow into this reference to produce per sample consensus genomes. Okay, we've set things up and then we can run it. And then as before, those new data sets will appear step by step in our history. And we just wait for the final result. 
in the meantime, because they are basically ready by now, we can look at the outputs of the reporting workflow. And those are the three topmost data sets here. So the variant frequency plot will hopefully be generated in an instance. But the two reports are there already. The format of these reports is uh, described in very much detail in the written tutorial. So you're really encouraged to work through this at the same time and uh, read about the format of these reports. What I want to show here really is that these reports turn the VCFs into a much more consumable format for us humans. So the combined variant report by sample basically takes all the variant calls from all these samples and aggregates them into one big list. And it has a first column that indicates the sample that is currently getting um, for which the variants are listed. Um, so it first lists all the variants of the first sample and then further down all the variants of the second sample and then of the third and so on and so forth. What you can see is this very nested long string that was initially in the info column of the VCFs is now um, extracted in a nice um, simple tabular format. And so we can find um, the, the, the reference sequence allele at a given position, 241 in this case, um, what the variant caller found instead at this position, which depth of reads was available to make this decision, what the allele frequency so 90, was, so 99.7% of those 2,586 reads confirmed this mutated allele. Um, what the impact according to SNPF of this position would be 241 is in the leader sequence, so it doesn't affect anything in terms of coding uh, regions. Um, um, yeah, which which gene um, got affected um, transcript identifier, so the, the, the name of the translated product. And this is where the feature mapping file got used. So we have now translated these NCBI RefSec identifier into these nicer names. Um, yeah, if there were other samples where this variant was found in and so on. And then more condensed is the combined variant report by variant. So this aggregates across samples now and only lists, uh, has one line per specific variant that was discovered. So like this doesn't repeat, but it only goes once through the um, SARS-CoV-2 genome, lists all the variants, um, what the effect would be at the codon, at the amino acid level, at the transcript level. Um, and then it lists the samples back here for which this particular mutation was observed. Right. So these are those reports. And then now the variant frequency plot is ready. And if we go into this one, then we'll see a nice overview plot and we can get rid of the tools bar here to see a bit more. Um, we can see visually separated from each other the three clusters we asked for. So apparently there is one bigger cluster with lots of seemingly very similar samples inside of it. And then we have two smaller clusters, one consisting only of two samples, one of three um, um, that are relatively different from the main cluster. Um, so each row here is one sample, as you already guessed probably. And then at the top, the top row, the colorful top row indicates the different genes in the SARS-CoV-2 reference genome. And each cell here is a mutation, a mutated position, a position that is mutated at least in one of the samples in the batch. So not all positions in the genome are shown, but only the ones that are affected by a variant, by a mutation in at least one of the samples in the batch. So that makes this plot a bit more concise. Um, and the colors of the cells indicate the observed allele frequency. So which fraction of reads confirmed a given mutation in a particular sample. And if that fraction is low as here, then that's always something to 
inspect, like for this sample number two here, um, there are lots of light colors in here, meaning not all reads um, covering these apparently mutated positions in that sample agreed on that mutation, but there were other reads that didn't confirm it. Um, and the tutorial goes into details how to make sense out of all this data, and I don't want to show you here the interpretation and the data. I just want to give you a quick tour of what's available and how you browse it. So because the sample names and the mutation names down here are really hard to read in the overview, you can use the zoom function of your browser to just dive in more closely. And this is a SVG file, so it will actually scale as much as you want it. You just need to um, move around here then. Now you can read the different the labels of the different cells, so which mutations they refer to, and you also have access to the sample names and you can compare this to other reports. Okay, and in the meantime you can see that um, the um, consensus workflow makes good progress, at least in terms of scheduling. Some jobs are also running. And so we just wait for this to finish. To, and then I'll show you how to, the end result will be a collection of consensus sequences in faster format, one per sample. And then for convenience to run then additional tools like Nextclade and, and Pangolin for lineage assignment, all these FASTAs are also joined into one multi-sample consensus FASTA with all sequences in one file. And this will then serve as input to those lineage assignment tools. And once this data set is ready, I'll show you how to run these tools on top of, um, of the consensus workflow. All right, that has worked nicely. All our jobs are finished and the final two results files um, and the result file and the collection are both green and inside of it, all inside of the collection, all 16 individual FASTA files are green. So we are ready to proceed with lineage assignment. Um, for the purpose of lineage assignment, there exist two um, widely used tools and Galaxy offers um, both um, for your own needs. So one of them is Pangolin um, and it's relatively straightforward to run through Galaxy, uh, saves you a lot of the install hassles um, of um, Pangolin assignment data and so on that you would normally experience when you try to do this from the command line. It asks for a possibly multi-sample multi consensus FASTA file, so, so that file should contain all the lineages you want to uh, uh, all the consensus sequences you want to have lineage assigned. And uh, yeah, that's the, the topmost file uh, produced by the consensus workflow just now. Um, Pangolin in version 4.2 up to this version still supports two analysis modes, Asha or Pangolearn. Asha is the de facto standard nowadays and Pangolearn more or less unmaintained, so just stick with Asha. Probably Pangolearn will go away soon in upcoming new releases of Pangolin. Um, then you have a couple of options here where the Pangolin data could come from. So to assign lineages, um, uh, Pangolin needs uh, knowledge about all previously determined, defined lineages, and these come in the form of uh, a pangolin data package. And you have various options here. You can use the pangolin data version that was shipping with the tool when it got released, with this version of pangolin when it got released. So that would be pangolin data version v1.17 in our case. Um, you can choose a specific pangolin data version 
cached on your Galaxy server. That is, if the Galaxy admins have installed different versions of that package, you can use that. And on usegalaxy.eu, you find lots of them. Um, this is nice because it also gives you for reproducibility access to previous releases of, of the data. Um, but as you can see, currently the latest we have installed on usegalaxy.eu is v1.17, and that's the same that was shipping with the tool, so we can just go with the simpler version. Then less recommended is the download latest available Pangolin data version from web. So this pulls down the very latest release of the data from GitHub where that data is hosted. Um, that's working, but it hinders reproducibility because when you do it with the same setting, when you run the tool with the same setting, again, it might pull in different Pangolin data. So this is really only recommended if you have a brand new batch of data where you suspect this might really contain the latest lineages that got defined by the Pango people. Um, and I really need the latest Pangolin data to assign those lineages correctly. Um, so for our purpose, this is data from already uh, one and a half years ago, the very early batch of Omicron data this is what we're analyzing here. Um, so definitely this uh, Pangolin data version that was shipping with the tool when it got released is all we need here. Um, same goes for constellations, just that, so that's a, a package that Pangolin uses under the hood to, to do the assignment. Um, and, and, and that is just different in that it gets less frequently updated. So its last update has been a while ago already. So the version shipping with the tool is still the current one and that's fine. Um, we do not need to change any of the default settings except that we might want a nice header line in our output so that we know what all the different columns mean that Pangolin is gonna produce in its report and then yeah we have an input file we have an analysis mode and we have included a header line and that's it we run the tool and that's all we need to do really um, the competitor of pangolin or the complementary tool to use um, is nextclade um, Nextclade works quite similar. It also asks for a possibly multi-sample consensus faster file and will assign lineages to all the sequences found in that file. Um, Nextclade also has support for some other viruses, limited support for monkeypox for certain strains of influenza A and influenza B viruses. Uh, so you have to choose the organism and the default choice is a good one. That's SARS-CoV-2. Um, you have the same option to use database versions cached on the Galaxy server um, or um, a, a, um, a version um, downloaded from the web freshly. Um, so in this case, just to demo that, I'm going to use the download latest available database version from web option, um, although it goes bit against the reproducibility idea. Um, we want the tabular format report. This is the equivalent to the pangolin report. There would be more options here um, for next clade. Um, you can of course you can for example output um, the aligned sequences so all the sequences um, in your batch in a multiple sequence alignment and uh, you can have the instead of a tabulate report you can ask for it in json format which is more machine passable um, and you could also have an a tree file in in json format but tabular format report is all we want for this tutorial like for pangolin we want to include the header line in the output um, and then we're done um, yeah and the output of these two tools is discussed quite nicely in the tutorial. So again, go through all the details there um, and try to make sense out of the um, things reported in those files. Um, the tutorial goes a bit further and 
creates aggregated reports out of these two files. Uh, so using a tool called Data Mesh, I'm not going to show you those steps here. We're also not going to inspect the output much here. It's just really described very well. So just be careful here. There are two data mesh versions installed on usegalaxy.eu. So if you click on them, you will see that one is 1.8 and the other one is 1.06. So a quite outdated version should so just go the first one for the first one and be sure you pick the 1.8 version when running data mesh. And this will let you like condense further these outputs of Nextclade and Pangolin for a nice comparison. Um, yeah, um, with that, I'm at the end of this brief demo. Um, and um, I wish you good luck um, following this tutorial and producing the same kind of outputs that I'm um, still currently producing here. Um, yeah, and um, hope you found it instructive and have a nice day. Bye-bye.